Hey boys and girls, we're gonna go ahead and finish out part two of our chapter from yesterday about when Sophie was meeting the queen. And then we're gonna go right on into the royal breakfast. So if you're reading along with me today in BFG, you're gonna start on page 154. It's at the very top of the page, right after the word shock. So it's the second paragraph, okay? Are you all right, ma'am? The maid was saying. When the queen spoke again, it was in a strange, strangled sort of whisper. Tell me, Mary, she said, tell me, quite truthfully, is there really a little girl sitting on my windowsill, or am I dreaming? She's sitting there all right, ma'am, as clear as daylight, but heaven only knows how she got there. Your majesty is certainly not dreaming at this time. But that's exactly what I did dream, the queen cried out. I dreamt that as well. I dreamt there would be a little girl sitting on my windowsill in her nighty, and she would talk to me. The maid, with her hands clasped against her starched white bosom, was staring at her mistress with a look of absolute disbelief on her face. The situation was getting beyond her. She was lost. She had not been trained to cope with this type of madness. Are you real? The queen said to Sophie. Y yes, your majesty. Sophie murmured. What is your name? Sophie, your majesty. And how did you get up onto my windowsill? No, don't answer that. Hang on a moment. I dreamed that part of it too. I dreamed that a giant put you there. He did, your majesty, Sophie said. The maid gave a howl of anguish and clasped her hands over her face. Control yourself, Mary, the queen said sharply. Then to Sophie, she said, you are not serious about the giant, are you? Oh yes, your majesty, he's out there in the garden now. Is he indeed, the queen said. The sheer absurdity of it all was helping her to regain her composure. So he's in the garden, is he? She said, smiling a little. He is a good giant, your majesty, Sophie said. You need not be frightened of him. I'm delighted to hear it, the queen said, still smiling. He's my best friend, your majesty. How nice, the queen said. He's a lovely giant, your majesty. I'm quite sure he is, the queen said, but why have you and this giant come to see me? I think you have dreamed that part of it too, your majesty, Sophie said calmly. That pulled the queen up short. It took the smile right off of her face. She certainly had dreamed that part of it. She was remembering now how at the end of her dream, it had said that a little girl and a big friendly giant would come and show her how to find the nine horrible man-eating giants. But be careful, the queen told herself. Keep very calm, because this is surely not very far from the place where madness begins. You did dream that, didn't you, your majesty, Sophie said. The maid was out of it now. She just stood there goggling. Yes, the queen murmured. Yes, now that you come to mention it, I did. But how do you know what I dreamed? Oh, that's a long story, your majesty, Sophie said. Would you like me to call the big friendly giant? The queen looked at the child. The child looked straight back at the queen, her face open and quite serious. The queen simply didn't know what to make of it. Was someone pulling her leg, she wondered. Shall I call him for you, Sophie went on. You'll like him very much. The queen took a deep breath. She was glad no one except her faithful old Mary was here to see what was going on. Very well, she said. You may call your giant. No, wait a minute. Mary, pull yourself together and give me my dressing gown and slippers. The maid did as she was told. The queen got out of bed and put on a pale pink dressing gown and slippers. You may call him now, the queen said. Sophie turned her head towards the garden and called out, BFG, her majesty the queen would like to see you. The queen crossed over to the window and stood beside Sophie. Come down off that ledge, she said. You're going to fall backwards any minute. Sophie jumped down into the room and stood beside the queen at the open window. Mary, the maid, stood behind them. Her hands were now planted firmly on her hips, and there was a look on her face which seemed to say, I want no part of this fiasco. I don't see any giant, the queen said. Please wait, Sophie said. Shall I take her away now, ma'am, the maid said. Take her downstairs and give her some breakfast, the queen said. Just then there was a rustle in the bushes beside the lake. Then out he came, 24 feet tall, wearing his black cloak with the grace of a nobleman, still carrying his long trumpet in one hand. He strode magnificently across the palace lawn towards the window. The maid screamed. The queen gasped. Sophie waved. The BFG took his time. 
He was very dignified in his approach. When he was close to the window where the three of them were standing, he stopped and made a slow, graceful bow. His head, after he had straightened up again, was almost exactly level with the watchers at the window. Your Majesty, he said, I is your humbug servant. He bowed again. Considering she was meeting a giant for the first time in her life, the queen remained astonishingly self-composed. We are very pleased to meet you, she said. Down below, a gardener was coming across the lawn with a wheelbarrow. He caught sight of the BFG's legs over to his left. His gaze traveled slowly upwards along the entire height of the enormous body. He gripped the handles of the wheelbarrow. He swayed. He tottered. Then he keeled over on the grass in a dead faint. Nobody noticed him. O oh, Magister, cried the BFG, O oh, Queen, O oh, Monarcher, O oh, Golden Sovereign, O oh, Ruler, O oh, Ruler of Straight Lines. O oh, Sultana, I am so glad to come here with my little friend Sophie to give you a... The BFG hesitated, searching for the word. To give me what, the Queen said. A... Uh, assistance, the BFG said, beaming. The Queen looked puzzled. He sometimes speaks a bit funny, your majesty, Sophie said. He never went to school. Then we must send him to school, the queen said. We have some very good schools in this country. I has great secrets to tell your magister, the BFG said. I should be delighted to hear them, the queen said, but not in my dressing gown. Shall you wish to get dressed, ma'am, the maid said. Have either of you had breakfast, the queen said. Oh, could we? Sophie cried. Oh, please, I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. Well, I was about to have mine, the queen said, but Mary dropped it. The maid gulped. I imagine we have more food in the palace, the queen said, speaking to the BFG. Perhaps you and your little friend would care to join me. Will it be repulsant snozcumbers, Magister? The BFG asked. Will it be what? The queen said. Stinky snozcumbers, the BFG said. What is he talking about? The queen said. It sounds like a rude word to me. She turned to the maid and said, Mary, ask them to serve breakfast for three in the, I think it had better be in the ballroom. That has the highest ceiling. To the BFG, she said, I'm afraid you'll have to go through the door on your hands and knees. I shall send someone to show you the way. The BFG reached up and lifted Sophie out of the window. You and I is leaving her magister alone to get dressed, he said. No, leave the little girl here with me, the queen said. We'll have to find something for her to put on. She can't have breakfast in her nighty. The BFG returned Sophie to the bedroom. Can we have sausages, your majesty, Sophie said, and bacon and fried eggs? I think that might be managed, the queen answered, smiling. Just wait till you taste it, Sophie said to the BFG. No more snozcumbers from now on. And boys and girls, that's the end of our chapter about the queen, and now we're going to move on to the royal breakfast. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants for when orders were received from the queen that a 24-foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom within the next half hour. The butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in the short time available. A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, sagacity, discretion, and a host of other talents that neither you or I possess. Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry sipping an early glass morning of light ale when the order reached him. In a split second, he had made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man requires a three-foot high table to eat off of, a 24-foot giant will require a 12-foot high table. And if a six-foot man requires a chair with a two-foot high seat, a 24-foot giant will require a chair with an eight-foot high seat. Everything, Mr. Tibbs told himself, must be multiplied by four. Two breakfast eggs must become eight. Four rashers of bacon must become 16. Three pieces of toast must become 12, and so on. These calculations about food were immediately passed on to Monsieur Papillon, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the bowl, ballroom. Butlers don't walk, they skim over the ground. Followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen all wear, wore knee breeches and every one of them displayed beautifully rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned ankle. It is the very first thing they look at when you are interviewed. 
Push the grand piano into the center of the room, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Butlers never raise their voices above the softest whisper. Four footmen moved the piano. Now fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three other footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of dressers and put it, placed it on top of the piano. Well, that will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It is exactly eight feet off the ground. Now we shall make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort. Fetch me four very tall grandfather clocks. There are plenty around the palace. Let each clock be 12 feet tall. Sixteen footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not easy to carry and required four footmen to each one. Place the four clocks in a rectangle eight feet by four alongside the grand piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footmen did so. Now fetch me the young prince's ping pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. <laughs> the ping pong table was carried in. Unscrew its legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now place the ping pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks, Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on step ladders. Mr. Tibbs stood back to survey the new furniture. None of it is in the classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave orders that a damask tablecloth should be draped over the ping pong table, and in the end, it looked really quite elegant after all. At this point, Mr. Tibbs seemed to hesitate. The footmen all stared at him, aghast. Butlers never hesitate, not even when they are faced with the most impossible problems. It is their job to be totally decisive at all times. Knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibbs was heard to mutter. Our cutlery will be like little pins in his hands. But Mr. Tibbs didn't hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new unused garden fork and also a spade. And for a knife, we shall use the great sword hanging on the wall in the morning room. But clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles I, and there may still be a little dried blood on the blade. When all this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler's eye over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a coffee cup for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find in the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the great sword. So much for the giant. Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small, delicate table and two chairs alongside the giant's table. This was for the queen and Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and chair towered far above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All these arrangements were only just completed when the queen, now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie, and to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked up a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and had pinned it on the left side of Sophie's chest. The big friendly giant followed them, but he had an awful job getting through the door. He had to squeeze himself through on his hands and knees, with two footmen pushing him from behind and two pulling from the front. But he got through in the end. He had removed his black cloak and got rid of his trumpet and was now wearing his simple ordinary clothes. As he walked across the ballroom, he had to stoop quite a lot to avoid hitting the ceiling. Because of this, he failed to, normous, failed to notice an enormous crystal chandelier. Crash! went his head right into the chandelier. A shower of glass fell upon the poor BFG. Gung hummers and bog swinkles, he cried. What was that? It was Louis the Fifteenth. the queen said, looking slightly put out. He's never been in a house before, Sophie said. Mr. Tibbs scowled. He directed four footmen to clear up the mess. Then, with a disdainful little wave of his hand, he indicated to the giant that he should seat himself on top of the chest of drawers on top of the grand piano. What a fizz-whizzling, flush-bunking seat, cried the BFG. I is going to be bug as a snug in a rug up here. Does he always speak like that? The queen asked. Quite often, Sophie said. He gets tangled up in his words. The BFG sat down on the chest of drawers of pianos and gazed in wonder around the great ballroom. By gumdrops, he cried. What a spliffling, wopsy room we is in. It is so gigantuous, I is needing binoculars and telescopes to see what is going on at the other end. Footmen arrived carrying silver trays with fried eggs, bacon, sausages, and fried potatoes. 
At this point, Mr. Tibbs suddenly realized that in order to serve the BFG at his 12 foot high grandfather clock table, he would have to climb to the top of one of the tall step ladders. What's more, he must do it balancing a huge warm plate on the palm of one hand and holding a gigantic silver coffee pot in the other. A normal man would have flinched at the thought of it, but good butlers never flinch. Up he went, up and up and up, while the queen and Sophie watched him with great interest. It is possible they were both secretly hoping he would lose his balance and go crashing to the floor, but good butlers never crash. At the top of the ladder, Mr. Tibbs, balancing like an acrobat, poured the BFG's coffee and placed the enormous plate before him. On the plate, there were eight eggs, 12 sausages, 16 rashers of bacon, and a heap of fried potatoes. What is this, please, your majester? The BFG asked, peering down at the queen. He has never eaten anything except snozcumbers before in his life, Sophie explained. They taste revolting. Well, they don't seem to have stunted his growth, the queen said. The BFG grabbed the garden spade and scooped up all the eggs, sausages, bacon, and potatoes in one go and shoveled them into his enormous mouth. By goggles, he cried. This stuff is making snozcumbers taste like swatch wallop. The queen glanced up, frowning. Mr. Tibbs looked down at his toes and his lips moved in silent prayer. That was only one titchy little bite, the BFG said. Is you having any more of this deluncheous grubble in your cupboard, Magister? Tibbs, the queen said, showing true regal hospitality, fetch the gentleman another dozen fried eggs and a dozen sausages. Mr. Tibbs swam out of the room, muttering unspeakable words to himself and wiping his brow with a white handkerchief. The BFG lifted the huge jug and took a swallow. Ouch, he cried, blowing a mouthful across the ballroom. Please, what is this horrible swig pill I is drinking, Magister? It's coffee, the queen told him, freshly roasted. It's filth, son, the BFG cried out. Where is the frobscottle? The what? The queen asked. Delumptuous, fizzy frobscottle, the BFG answered. Everyone must be drinking frobscottle with breakfast, Magister. Then we can all be whiz-popping happily together afterwards. What does he mean, the queen said, frowning at Sophie. What is whiz-popping? Sophie kept a very straight face. BFG, she said. There is no frob scuttle here, and whiz-popping is strictly forbidden. What? cried the BFG. No frob scuttle? No whiz-popping? No galumptuous music? No boom, boom, boom? Absolutely not. Sophie told him firmly. If he wants to sing, please don't stop him, the queen said. He doesn't want to sing, Sophie said. He said he wants to make music, the queen went on. Shall I send for a violin? No, your majesty, Sophie said. He's only joking. A sly little smile crossed the BFG's face. Listen, he said, peering down at Sophie. If they isn't having any frob scottle here in the palace... I can still go whiz popping perfectly well without it if I is trying hard enough. No, cried Sophie. Don't. You're not to. I beg you. Music is very good for the digestion, the queen said. When I'm up in Scotland, they play the bagpipes outside the window while I'm eating. Do play something. Okay, and boys and girls, we're going to stop there for today and we'll pick up the rest of the chapter tomorrow and find out if the BFG really does whiz pop in front of the queen. See you later. Bye, guys.